Can I just tell you guys, I am so happy to be here. You guys, this has been a journey um, that not many people will understand, um, not many people have gone through. Um, but when I was asked to, to speak tonight, um, I was, I had just had a brand new baby girl. It was like, So when I got the phone call that, hey, we want you to speak at fight night, I was not thinking about that at all. I was like, cool, I got you. I'll do it. And then before I knew it, time was rolling. Time was going by, and I was like, oh, man, it's, it's around the corner. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you guys. I feel like I have a word that God's given me um, that's so, so pertinent um, for right now. So before we begin, let's go ahead and let's pray again. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in the life of all the men here in fight night. I pray, Father, that you would be here, Father. I pray that it would be your words that are heard and not mine, Father. I pray that I will fade to the background and you will be at the forefront, Lord. Be with us during this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I would, I would uh, be remiss if, since I get the opportunity to speak at fight night, if I didn't give you guys a brief history lesson on the origins of Fight Night. So, in the beginning was the word, and the word was... The, in the beginning, there really was no men's ministry at Fusion Church. And um, I had been told that different men had tried starting something at different times, and it never really panned out. And I felt, we need to have a men's ministry. So I spoke with a pastor that was here at the time, Pastor Tom Wood. And if you're watching Pastor Tom Wood, holla at your boy. Um, and I said, hey, why don't we have a men's ministry? You know, the women got a mago day. You know, where's a mago dude? You know what I'm saying? Where's a mago bro? We got to have something. And he said, go talk to Alan Witten. And then Alan Witten brought along Nick Ferloni because they had just been through a freedom group together. And so the three of us got together and... It was crazy because it seemed like almost immediately we just gelled, right? It could only be a God thing, right? But what made it even crazier, and I hope he's watching right now, is that I could not stand Alan Witten. <laughs> Let's just, I'm just going to be real. He got on my nerves. And I've told him this story, he's, so he's cool. But he got on my nerves because he's that guy that when he sees a man by himself, he's going and talking to and I'm that guy, like, bro, chill out. Leave me alone. You know what I'm saying? Let me, let me get my, my bearings. But, we're, but besides all that, we still gelled. You know, and this is amazing how God works. You know, he brings these guys from, from three different backgrounds, three different upbringings, and here we are. And our very first fight club meeting was in a diner with six of us. Six of us. And look around you. We have what? 87? 81, close to 90 guys are here tonight. That's amazing. That's only because of God. So, but you see, even starting something like Fight Club, and we knew it needed to happen. We knew it was of God, but it was scary. Because who were we, right? Who were we to think that we could lead other men? What if you guys did not care about anything that we had to say? Right? What if you guys were just like, ah, whatever? What if we failed? We fell on our faces. And that brings me to the title of this message that I really struggled with. And that's the fear of manhood. And I've said it before, it's real hard to be a man. And we have things that we do and we go through that women just don't understand. And sometimes God puts things in front of you. And it's scary. See, have you ever been in a situation where you were supposed to do something, you knew the Lord had a plan for your life, and then fear stopped you? Cold in your tracks. It could be taking a job or quitting a job, getting married, not getting married. For our fusion uh, students that are here, some of you may have graduated high school. Do I go on to college? Do I get a job? Do I go to ministry? What does God have for me? 
See, but the Lord has a way of putting things in front of us that seem crazy, that seem impossible, that as if there's no way that it's going to work out. But it's in those moments that he shows his power. It's in those moments that he shows that he's in control. And it's in those moments that we realize just how much control we don't really have. Because we like to be in control, right, brothers? The Bible's full of amazing stories of people who were told to do something ridiculous, made no sense. Build a boat. It's going to rain. Oh, by the way, I know you never heard of a boat before. I know it's never rained before. Just go ahead and do it. It's crazy. Hey, so my people are in captivity, right? So go ahead and take them from the most powerful world power that there is. Go ahead and rescue them. Take them over to this other land. There's a city. You don't got to fight it. Walk around it seven times. Just walk around it. You're good. You see that giant that's cursing my name? You see that slingshot on your waist? Go ahead and, and use that. The false prophets and the king who have killed my men, killed my prophets, confront him by yourself. I got you. Hey, you know that fiery furnace that the king's got over there? I got you. Don't worry about that. The den of lions, not a big deal. Not a big deal. Go speak to the king. Going into his presence could meet certain death. Go do it. It's crazy, right? I don't know about y'all. Not this guy. Under my own strength, right? Because it, it seems ridiculous. See, these handful of examples made no sense while they're involved. But when they stopped, when they listened to what the word of the Lord was telling them, they knew that everything was going to work out. See, and there was another man in the Bible. For all intents and purposes, he was free from his obligations. The law told him he was free. His, his friends and I'm sure his family told him he was free. He was ready and more than willing to throw in the towel. He's a very important person in the Bible, but he's someone we don't talk about very often at all. So if you have your Bible or your iPhone or whatever, go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. And when you get it, give me a yeah. Nobody? Yeah. Man, you guys need to wake up. I'm, I got to get more crazy, don't I? Yeah. Woo! Give me a year. Yeah. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took, him, took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So you're asking, Jason, why are you talking about a Christmas story? It is hot outside. We couldn't even have hot dogs outside. It was, oh, it was ridiculous. See, Joseph's not a man that we talk about often. In the Bible. He's only mentioned in, in the book of Matthew and Luke, and very briefly. And when we find Joseph, he's upset because he was betrothed to Mary and he, he was given some news. Baby girl got knocked up, right? Can I say that in church? Is that cool? I don't want to get in. See, pastor, see, pastors, they're already, they're already taking notes. They're like, uh uh, no more. You're done. You know, see? I'm going to get one of those, those, those hooks. They're going to pull me off the stage. So, in Jewish tradition and in, in, in the, uh, the culture, there was three steps. To, to marriage. There was engagement, which was when um, the, the marriage was arranged, and then after that there was betrothal that made the engagement 
binding, and now they were known as husband and wife. And then finally it was marriage, and now it's, the, the, the deal is sealed. So for, they, were, they were husband and wife. And he was obligated to marry this woman, but now he was being told she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Like, I, right, girl, I, okay. But then this brings me to my first point. When God gives us a job, it often worries us before it blesses us. We think that there's no way I can do this. See, Joseph's trying to figure out how he can get out of the situation as quietly as possible without drawing attention to himself or to Mary. You know, he's just like, show me how I can get out of here. How can I get out of this? He didn't view this pregnancy as a gift. He didn't see it as a gift. He probably didn't care about the story that Mary told him about the angel and the Son of God and Messiah and all that stuff. And you know she told him that story. It's not in the Bible, but you know she told him that story. You know why? How many of y'all are married or have a girlfriend? Have they ever not told you every single detail of every story in the history of stories? Right? And then they give you details about those details, and you're like, baby girl, I don't care. Just tell me, what, what are we doing for dinner? So you know she told, at least the gospel according to Jason, that's, that's the way it happened. Right? But you know she told him the whole story. But he didn't care. See, many times when God gives us a gift, we, our tendency is to run from it. Because who knows what's in the gift when it hasn't been unwrapped. That's good. That's good. Perhaps it's how the gift is wrapped that makes us scared. Because sometimes the greatest gifts that God gives us are, are wrapped in chaos, in controversy, in anxiety, and in problems. It's often camouflaged in horrible circumstances. And so we run from it. See, the gifts can come from, be, from being fired from a job. They can be from being abandoned. But God's gifts always pay off at the end. And I'm sure, I know there are men in this room who've waited out the storm. And they're, 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 they're living in the gifts that God has given them. Because, but they've gone through the fire. They've got, you've gone through the lion's den. But brothers, listen to this. The enemy is counting on you giving up. He's counting on you giving up on the calling on the promise, on the vision that God has given each and every one of you. And if you don't think you have a vision, my brothers, spend more time in prayer and in the word because God has a word for each and every one of you. See, initially when, when God gives a gift, a, a gift, it doesn't come with joy and praise and happiness. It often causes confusion. And then you wonder if this gift came from God or if this is a ploy of the enemy to destroy you. You would think that, that Joseph would be excited about the birth of Jesus. Because again, this was something that had been prophesied. To this day, there are Jews waiting for the Messiah. So you know back then, they knew that a Messiah was coming. So you would think, this is a good thing. God chose my woman. The woman that I chose, God also chose. The woman that I set aside to be my wife, God also set aside. And, you, and this fact alone that God has selected Mary should have eased his mind about her, her, her being a virtuous woman. But you know, sometimes when we're chosen by God, it leaves us in disarray. It leaves us lost, not knowing what to do, how to do it. See, the first thing that the angel tells Joseph is to fear not. Fear not. Fear not is all over the Bible. Because fear can paralyze your faith. Fear can limit your perspective. Fear can intimidate your growth. Fear can make you give up on something too soon. Fear can make you give up on something that God is going to use to bless you. Fear can make you put away, like Joseph, something that's your only redemption. See, Joseph, he was about to give away his Savior. Give it away. Out of fear. Be careful, be careful, be careful that fear 
Does it rob you of the gifts that God wants to give to you? So there are three types of fear that, that can overcome us as men. And they can, they can take over our mind. They can control our actions if we allow them. The first is the fear of judgment. Oftentimes when God gives you a gift, it, call, it, it causes us to be controversial um, in the eyes of people around us. And this is why it's so important to have the right circle around you. This is why we started Fight Club. Because if you go through life alone, it's going to be easy to allow those gifts, allow the calling to walk away. But you need a circle of men around you all, at all times. We have gone to battle together. We have shed tears together. We have laughed. We have fought. I won. And we have, and, but we did it together. And I know Nick Ferloni, Alan Winton are my guys that if I have an issue, I can call. I can pick up the phone and they're going to answer. Who is the guy in your life? Who is the one that you can call to? And don't tell me, well, my wife is my best friend. Okay, you tell your wife everything? Let's be real. That's what I thought. We don't, come on now. Come on now. Let's go ahead and cut the feed off. We're going to get real. I'm playing. But you need men in your life. Because who else can better understand you other than God than another man? Blessings can be scary. And if we weren't so blessed, you wouldn't be so hated. That's how, that's how our, our world treats us. When good things happen, there's always something bad that someone's got to say. Get on the social media. It could be the happiest post in the world. I saved a bunch of puppies from a fiery building and, well, you missed one puppy. So how could you do that? There's always something negative, right? Nothing can, you, no one can ever be happy for the good things that happen. Brothers, shake off the fear of judgment. People are going to judge you. Who cares? Whose opinion are you, are you concerned about? Brothers, what are you more afraid of? The perceptions of other people or the gift that God wants to give to you? What are you more afraid of? The next fear is the fear of supply. Can I afford this gift? Do I have what it takes to maintain this calling? Be careful that when God takes you to a place of blessing that, you, that you're so worried about the cost that you don't enjoy it. See, the text doesn't tell us that Joseph had no money. Joseph had money. He went to the inn, right? You don't go to a hotel if you don't have no money, right? You don't. But you see, sometimes you need provisions that even money cannot buy. Isn't it frustrating when you realize the money you need for the things that you need to do? Then you find out that the money isn't the only provision you need to sustain where God has taken you. Opening this building, pastor, we needed more than money. We need a whole lot more than money because the money came. But there were other things, other provisions that needed to come so we could be in the Egg Harbor Township location. We needed more than money to move forward to the Cumberland County location. Fear not, brothers, because God has those provisions covered. He has a place all ready for you. We were looking for, for a meeting place for the Cumberland County location for a long time. We looked at a lot of buildings. Some, some ooh, sweet Jesus. Some, some seedy buildings. Some, some dirty buildings. Some, let me move on before I get in trouble again. And God, but God already had the meeting place ready for us. Years before the vision came to the pastors of the church to open up another location. God is already working it. You see, when people shut doors on you and they're going to shut doors on you, it's only a sign that God's about to open up another door in your life. Thank God for shut doors. God will open a door for you and you don't have to fear any man shutting it. Revelation 3, 8 says, See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. See, my brothers, wherever God guides you, he will provide for you. And the third fear, fear for lack of direction. If I go, Lord, will you go with me? 
God's direction will often take you from normal places because where God is going to bless you, it may be in a way that you never imagined. It may seem ridiculous. God may be telling you to quit a job and then telling you, I got the provisions in place. And you think to yourself, are you really going to go with me? Are you really going to take me by the hand and walk me through this? But God's going to take you in places that make no sense, away from the norm, outside the system, in a place that you never thought a blessing could be. I've been through things in my life that when I was going through it, I didn't think was a blessing. I thought it was a curse from the pit of hell. But looking back, in retrospect, praise God for those shut doors. Thank God for those hard times. Why? Because they make you hard. They make you strong. We've all been through some tough times. Some of us have been divorced. We've lost family members. We've lost jobs. But you're here. You're here and you're still standing. Amen? Amen. And we can worry, but God doesn't worry like we do. Thank God. Because he knows the end from the beginning. He has already planned for our screw-ups. He's already planned for our human nature messing things up. God is never going to send you anywhere that he's not already at. Matthew 28, 20 says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's this mean? It means you're never alone. You always have him. You just got to reach out to him. But fear will make you feel like you're alone. When you feel like feel like you're alone, remember this. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. We use that verse a lot, right? When we want to pray for something, hey, two or three, let's gather, let's gather together, let's, let's pray. But what if you are alone? Does that verse still apply? I'll come back to that. Luke 4.10 says, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And here Jesus was referencing Psalms 91 verse 11 where he, when he said, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. See, God charges his angels to watch over us and surround us with his divine protection. So, Jason, what are you saying about all this? Two or three are gathered, angels. What's that mean? It means you have a team wherever you go. So, where are my military guys at? We have, yeah. Since it was just 4th of July, let's talk about some military stuff real quick, all right? So, in the military, you have what's called a fire team. Fire team is a four-man four -man team that is able to, conduct, that has greater tactical flexibility than a squad, Right? or a huge, you know, battalion, or then every branch is different. But a fire team is, remains the same, a four-man team, a tactical team. They conduct tactical operations against the enemy. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You've got your Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I will give my angels charge over you. Four. You have a spiritual fire team at your disposal at all times. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to fight. You just have to allow them to go before you and fight your battles. Joseph was so worried that God said, said that God had to speak to him in his dreams. Because when we're awake, we don't listen. Sometimes when we're praying, we actually have to stop, shut our mouths, and listen. So we had to come to Joseph in a dream, the only time that God knew that he can get a hold of Joseph. Because I'm sure Joseph prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed some more. And God's like, I, 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 homie, you going to give me a chance to speak? And he does that to us. And it was in his dreams that he was able to get through to him. It said, do not be afraid. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Stop worrying about how things are going to turn out. 
Because if God starts something, he's going to finish it. You see, what was in Mary, God didn't start. Oh, excuse me, Joseph didn't start. So he had no reason to be worried about it. You may be on a new adventure, a new, a new plan or purpose. You've been praying and you feel God's leading you to do something. But if, you don't, if you're not the one that starts it, you don't have to worry about how it's going to be finished. Philippians 1.6 says, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If God starts it, he's going to finish it. Joseph never consummated his relationship with Mary until after Jesus was born. Now, I don't know about y'all, but my wife just had a baby. And I don't care how big she thought she was, she was still fine, fine, fine. Right? I mean, be real. So, you know, it took something from Joseph to not touch his wife because he was honoring God. So, but what's the point of them even bringing that little point up? What's that mean? Don't mess with things while God is working on them. Leave it alone. Let God be God. He doesn't need your help. God was handling all this before we were around. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure he knows what he was doing, right? God was God before we were around to call him God. So why are we worrying so much? God doesn't wait till people reject you to have a place prepared for you. God already had a manger prepared for Mary and Joseph, even before the hotels were being shut on them. Where is that place that God has set up for you? See, I ran from my calling. For nearly three decades, I ran from my calling. Being in ministry it was something I had zero desire to do. I was young, dumb, making stupid decisions. I did everything in my power to avoid being in ministry. But then through a series of events that could have only been Jesus. That could have only been orchestrated by God himself. I stand before you with a restored faith, a restored marriage, a restored family, a restored calling. But none of that would have happened if I allowed fear to take over. Fear is nothing but a lie of the enemy. It's nothing but a lie of the enemy. It stops us from achieving our full potential. And the fear that I'm talking about is deeper than a fear of pain. It's a fear that finds its roots in the core of who you are. It makes you question your identity. That's the fear I'm talking about. And that's the fear the enemy tries to get a hold of and manipulate. So you turn away from God. It's a fear the enemy will latch on to to manipulate you. So as we begin to close, brothers, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And it's nothing that I don't need an answer for. This is for you, for you to think about if you're taking notes. What is that calling, that promise, that gift that God has given you? What is it? And it's something you may be afraid of. You probably are afraid of. And if you know what that calling is, are you running away from it? Are you running away from it? And finally, what is keeping you from pursuing your calling? What is that fear? What is that rejection? What is that, that hurt that is keeping you away from it? I can tell you where, where it's coming from. It's not coming from God. It's definitely coming from the enemy. See, my brothers, when fear is trying to stop you, continue moving forward. When fear has punched you in the gut and you feel like you're all alone, Remember that you have a spiritual fire team that has already cleared the way for you. Already made a way. You just got to keep walking. That's the greatest thing about this whole thing. We think we have to fight. We're called Fight Club. But we don't really have to fight. 
We fight our battle on our knees with our brothers praying. We fight our battles with tears. We fight our battles when we push each other, when we lift each other up. That's how you fight your battles. You just need to call out to God and he will come through to you. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and pray as we come to a close. Father, I want to thank you for this night, Lord God. I want to thank you what, for, for each of these men who took the time to come out, Lord, and just receive a word from you, Lord God. I pray, Father, that when the enemy comes to try to distract them, to try to stop them, to try to hold them down, Lord God, that they will be able to recognize immediately where the attack is coming from. Father, I pray that each one of my brothers here and online, Lord, that they will not allow fear to dictate their actions, Lord God, but that they will walk in victory, victory in the name of Jesus, Father. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.